Hello, my name is Andrew Barnhart. I'm a Marie Curie Research Associate and Doctoral Candidate at the Center for Biomedical Ethics and Law at KU Leuven. And today, I'm going to talk to you about organoids and their moral status. But first, we need to know what organoids are, how they're used, and why they're important. Organoids are self-arranging 3D multicellular in vitro structures. They closely resemble different types of tissues and perform at least some of the functions found in their full organ counterparts. These mini organs can be created from either embryonic stem cells, adult stem cells, or induced pluripotent stem cells made from patient tissue samples. Organoid models can represent all kinds of human organs, heart, liver, kidney, lung, stomach, eyes, skin, bone, brain, and many others. They can even replicate the various stages of embryogenesis in embryonic development. These organoid models are used in a wide variety of experiments. To name a few, regenerative medicine, toxicology, drug development, post-microbe interactions, gene editing, omics, phylogenetic studies, developmental biology, disease modeling, and precision medicine. There's a lot of hope for organoids and how they may impact these research areas. However, it's important to understand that organoids are not exact copies of organs. They're merely organ-like in some ways, and are not able to develop into full organs. So, for example, brain organoids are not able to develop into full brains in petri dishes but they can grow roughly to the size of a pea, about four millimeters in diameter. You can see some here. Pretty cool. The structures of organoids are also misarranged. Identifiable tissues and organ structures are present, but they may not be in their correct positions or connected to each other properly. Think of it like this. If your organs are like a car, then an organoid is like a smaller, jumbled-up version of that car. The parts are misarranged. The tailpipe is sticking out of the roof, the steering wheel is in the trunk, the windows are on the floor. You can still turn on the radio, but you can only get a few radio stations. Hence the name organoid. They are only organ-like. We should now turn our attention to the question of moral status. In short, Moral status can be thought of as a matter of who counts within our moral community, and what kinds of moral obligations we owe to these members of that community. So, for example, an adult human being counts as a full member within our moral community, and gets the highest amount of moral considerations and moral obligations that come with being a full moral member. But most philosophers and ethicists would probably agree that an entity like a mouse would not have the same moral status as a human being. This might be because a mouse doesn't have the same level of cognitive abilities, self-awareness, or just because it's a different species from a human being. Whatever the reason, we often treat entities like mice differently and give them different moral considerations. So what is the moral status of an organoid exactly? What do we morally owe them, if anything? Some bioethicists find it useful to differentiate between types of organoids in order to talk about their moral status. So, for example, a brain organoid and a gastroloid, an organoid that models a stage of embryogenesis, would not have the same moral status as a liver, lung, or kidney organoid. Brain organoids and gastroloids have unique moral considerations that other organoids do not. After all, if a brain organoid models a human brain, and the brain is the source of consciousness, then the brain organoid too could have some form of consciousness, which is often considered a relevant factor in determining moral status. The higher degree of consciousness or cognitive abilities, the higher degree of moral status. As of now, there's very little concern that brain organoids possess any form of basic consciousness or the ability to feel pain or pleasure. But there are some experiments that could raise concerns and require serious consideration. For instance, the Sakaguchi lab at Kyoto University created brain organoids capable of synchronous activity across cellular clusters. 
And, at least according to one hypothesis, this synchronous neuronal activity may be the basis of certain brain functions, such as perception and memory. So, as brain organoids get closer to modeling full brains, it's possible to imagine that they could develop a form of consciousness or other cognitive abilities, thus increasing their moral status. Now, turning to gastroloids, they also have unique challenges to their moral status. A gastroloid models embryonic gastrulation, a later stage in the formation of the embryo. While gastroloids are not viable like typical human embryos, a close resemblance of the model may require a higher degree of moral consideration. Gastroloids may raise questions about the need to revisit the 14-day rule. This rule allows researchers to develop a human embryo in vitro for 14 days until the appearance of a primitive streak. Finally, less controversial organoids such as liver, lung, or intestinal organoids are not off the hook either when it comes to questions of their moral status. Even if these organoids are considered to be the moral equivalent to their full organ counterparts or biological tissues, then they may need to be subject to similar rules and regulations for their distribution and use. So, what are we supposed to do if organoids have a moral status? How are scientists supposed to morally treat brain organoids or gastroloids and consider their interests? Should they be kept alive as long as possible? Should they treat organoids differently if they're from a different species? Do researchers morally owe less to a mouse brain organoid than to a human brain organoid? There isn't yet a consensus on the answers to these questions in the bioethics community either. Sarah Bors presents organoids as having a hybrid moral status, insofar as organoids may lie somewhere between the moral status of a subject and a biological object. Julian Coplin presents a moral framework of tiered principles for brain organoids, depending on their level of development. Bioethicists are only just beginning to have these conversations, and more will come. But what do you think? Do you think organoids deserve a higher degree of moral status? Or are they just lumps of cells and tissue? If they do have a moral status, what do scientists morally owe them? Maybe in time, some sort of consensus and conclusions will be reached. I hope you enjoyed this mini bioethics exploration. And thank you for watching.